Last year, we had a discussion about iVersion and the inode change attribute and timestamps. And uh, this year, uh, Amir asked me to give a rundown of where we are with all this. And the short answer is pretty much right where we started last year. So, uh, so anyway, just a, qu a quick uh, a recap. Um, NFSV4 adds a change uh, attribute, which was uh, mostly in response to the fact that V3 and V2 used uh, um, timestamps heavily to try to detect when there are changes to files on the server. The problem is that that's not nearly uh, not nearly granular enough. You know, you can have a whole lot of changes inside of a single time, timer tick. Uh, Linux uses coarse grain timestamps of about, you know, with about two milliseconds of granularity. We can squeeze a whole lot of writes into two milliseconds these days, so that's no good. Uh, so NFS v4 mandates a change attribute. Um, you can actually implement it in several different ways, but it, the idea is that it's just a 64-bit value that we, that is guaranteed to change any time either the, uh, any time the C time would change, basically. Uh, we don't want to change it on A time updates, obviously, because we don't want to invalidate caches because of reads. But everything else in the inode, pretty much, if that changes, then we need to, you know, change the C time, or change the change attribute. Um, so there's quick uh, NFS, you know, V42 uh, actually expanded this a little bit um, and allowed you to uh, present, uh, or to, for the server to uh, state what sort of change attribute it is uh, providing. Uh, that allows the client to sometimes make better choices about when to invalidate the cache. Uh, you know, if it's monotonically increasing and you see a, uh, an old change attribute, you can kind of just discard that and you don't have to worry about invalidating your cache, right? But if you see a, a newer one, then you generally do. And then there's some others in here too as well. Uh, this is all part of the, uh, our, the uh, NFS v4.2 uh, spec. But uh, so in, in Linux, we uh, usually store this, or most file systems um, uh, track this inside the, uh, the inode i version field. Um, so um, if you have, uh, uh, but there's a lot of problems with it and a lot of inconsistency between different file systems about how they use this. Um, in, in particular, um, XFS has a problem now that uh, it, it has its own change attribute that is not quite, uh, doesn't follow this, the semantics that, it, that most of the others do. Uh, in particular, it bumps it on A time updates. Um, and that's been a, a problem for us in that, you know, you can occasionally see, if, if you have A times turned on, which nobody does really, but if you had that on, then you would, anytime there's a read, you would see an invalidation, right? But even with rel A time, which can kind of work around this, you still will get a, you know, a, a spurious cache invalidation once, you know, once a, a day, I guess, you know, whenever the, the thing gets updated because of the A time. Um, XFS guys have also been reluctant in the past to grow their inode to accommodate a new change attribute that does follow the right semantics. So we've, you know, we've tried a couple of different approaches to try to, to fix this. Um, Derek and I were talking earlier today, it seems like maybe the reticence is a little less now, so I don't know, maybe we'll see. Uh, and then also, uh, bcachefs still needs to have it, theirs implemented. Uh, I know Kent carved 64 bits out of the, out of the on-disk inode for, for this, so we should be able to do that fairly trivially. Uh, it's just a matter of rolling up the patches. Um, other problem, uh, counter, typically when we do um, a, a write, we always, we typically update the timestamps and the change attribute prior to copying the data to the page cache. And this is a problem because if you have a read that races in there right after you've updated the timestamp, but before you do that copy, then you could associate the uh, wrong state of the file with that new change attribute, and that could persist for a very long time. I mean, in, until the thing is updated again. So your client could sit there and see, you know, have an old, uh, old copy of the data that uh, just won't go away. If we do it after, uh, you might get a little window of opportunity, or a little window of time when things are wrong, but it should resolve itself pretty quickly if we did it on, after. Is, Go ahead, Sam. is that race realistically solvable? Uh, updating the counter after doing the write, that doesn't seem to work either. And I don't, there, there isn't really a lock that we can use here because the buffered read path, maybe I'm getting this wrong and this doesn't apply to how NFS does things, but the buffered read path doesn't take any inode locks. It doesn't right. even take the folio lock these days. Right, yeah, yeah, the, the idea is that, uh, yeah, so it, um, it, doing it after would be better. 
but it's not perfect. You know, you, you, you know, in, in this case, you know, if, if you take it, if you bump it after, then the data will certainly be copied first before you see it. So, so you might see the, the new data associated with an, you know, with an older change attribute, but your client would then see the new change attribute fairly soon after, and then that problem should resolve itself fairly quickly. That's, that's, why, I, that's why I usually advocate for doing this after. Uh, and then we have another problem, which is potential lost updates due to crashes. We don't log these things to disk before we start handing them out in NFSD. So uh, if, um, you know, if you crash, if it's possible for NFSD to hand these things, these values out and then crash and you see the value roll back. Um, and the worst case is like if you were to go and then do another change on top of that, uh, that you might see, you know, then we might have two different states of the file associated with the same uh, change attribute value, which is, you know, could be bad news. So, just so you know, there's a patch set that I've been working on based on an idea by John uh, that's called write SRCU that wraps the, the entire write period from begin to end with an SRCU so that you can sort of update in memory before, but don't write it to disk until you did uh, SRCU uh, sync, synchronize. So I don't know if it's usable. I didn't expose it enough for people to shout at me yet, but uh, know that the patches exist. Okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll have to take a look at that. I'm not, I'll have to see whether that can maybe help. That's a, that'd be a good thing. So in any case, uh, what we do uh, in NFSD to try to mitigate this is that we factor in the C time as well. So, we, so we'll squish the, the, uh, the change attribute and the C time together. Uh, that way, you know, the only way you should get a duplicate change attribute is if the um, is if you had a crash and rollback and the clock rollback, which is all pretty unlikely. So at least yeah. we think so anyway. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm just confused about you saying NFSD doesn't wait until the value is logged before it starts presenting it to clients. Um, NFSD on changes calls the commit metadata uh, callback, doesn't it? It does, but we yeah. we we are just doing a bare atomic uh, atomic read out of the out of the inode. So as soon as it's bumped, if if the if we you do a stat or or sorry, if you do a get adder against it, we can get that um, we could get that value before it ever got logged to the to the to the journal. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. That's not what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, and the, other, the last thing is this thing is difficult to test because you can't see it from user land. Uh, so we want to be able to, you know, it would be nice to be able to query this in user land too. Uh, so I had an idea, or Dave had an idea actually last year, Dave Chinner had an idea last year um, to do, to uh, conditionally use um, fine grain timestamps. Uh, I mean, I've got some stuff up here. The, long story short, uh, it exp we found a problem with it while working on it in that you could have a, if you could hand out a fine grain timestamp uh, and then, or you could, you could, give a, stamp a file with a fine grain timestamp and then have another file changed after it that gets a coarse grain timestamp and it would look like they were modified in the reverse order. So that breaks some little known tools like make and rsync. Uh, so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen so we've, uh, uh, so we backed that out and didn't, didn't do it. I, I think this is probably a fixable problem uh, the only thing we would have to do is be to set uh, that when we hand out a fine grain timestamp, we could set the set that as a floor for all for, for all coarse grain timestamps from there on. Uh, but uh, Christian and Linus were kind of tired of this at that point, I think, and I, I didn't push too hard. <laughs> so um, that's a possibility, though. We could think about resurrecting that and trying trying to go go that route again. Uh, Dave also had another idea, um, which was to Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Oh, okay, fair enough, all right. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not intending to do it in that merge window again, for the record, but some, well, that, that maybe that's a good idea then. Maybe we should just think about re resurrecting that. Uh, that. The good thing about this multi-grain timestamp thing is that it fixes uh, problems with NFS v3, which would be a huge, huge win too. Uh, you know, a lot of people still use NFS v3, and having better cache coherency across that would be a wonderful thing. And also would you know probably fix some other things. I think Leonard was ma mentioning earlier that he you know that uh, he was lamenting about the, our timestamp granularity and being able to have much more fine-grained timestamps could be a, a good thing. 
So in any case, well, there's another alternative. Um, we could uh, try to hide the change attribute in, in the unused parts of the seed time. So uh, the TV NSEC field in the bottom half of the, of the um, of a time spec is 32 bits, but we don't use nearly all that. Uh, and we could, uh, tr we could lop off the uh, bottom part of the, um, the bottom, we, we could truncate the, the thing out to a, you know, closer to where, to our actual time stamp granul granularity, and then use those lot of, those low order bits as a counter that would be sort of like a, a you know, for every C time, every time the C time ticks, we would just set that to zero, and then every time there's a change within that timer tick, we would just bump that counter. Uh, and, and then we'd have to do a little munging to, to expose the right parts for each, you know, for whether we're doing a timestamp, showing the timestamp or the, or, the, uh, or the change attribute, but that's a, 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 po a potential possibility. The, the only catch here is that we'd need to do this pretty, we'd have to do that truncation of the timestamps universally across all file systems, I think. I think we'd have to, like, uh, you know, it, it would look funny if, uh, you know, XFS, you know, had these sort of truncated timestamps, but ButterFS did not, right? You know, or, and they're on the same box. That could be weird. Um, but maybe not. Um, so Linux has a <clears throat> particular order of operations. Um, you know, the queries of iVersion don't do any locking, like Dave was mentioning. Uh, so as soon as the thing uh, is updated, which we do currently before anything happens, uh, then you can potentially show that, uh, that, uh, that version value to, uh, to clients. Uh, so there's no serialization there. Uh, we usually update the iVersion alongside the C time, uh, but, um, and for directories, we usually actually, we, we do actually do it at, on the, after the operation on the directories, because uh, most everything in directory, you know, directory operations are done under the uh, inode RWSM. Uh, but for writes, we do it before, and that's been a bit of a problem. Um, so in any case, uh, there's some other stuff here too we can do, but uh, w one thing we could do, um, because the way we bump the I version, we don't actually increment it unless someone has queried it since it was last, uh, since it was last um, changed. So we could potentially leave the I version bump in before and do one after, uh, which is not a bad idea really. Uh, that second I version bump will almost always be a no op, so it wouldn't probably be too costly. So I, I may experiment with that. I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, so we don't really actually have to do that for XFS because it holds the inode uh, RWSM around uh, reads and writes uh, in some fashion. Um, but the but most of the others will need to have some sort of uh, would need probably to do both. Um, and then we have the problem of crash resilience. Um, this is a bigger problem that I've not done sufficient research of yet, but we've at least uh, kind of identified that it's a potential problem. Um, so, you know, uh, Jan had an idea, Jan Kara had an idea that we could factor in a crash counter somehow that we'd have to track by user land. Uh, NFSD has a, um, has a user land daemon that it uses to track some client info. Uh, and so we could potentially have that also track a crash counter pretty easily. Um, so this is something, this is more uh, a, a more blue sky sort of uh, thing that we would need to do. It's a, quite a bit of work, I think, to make it happen, but it's a potential way to mitigate the problem of, uh, cr of rolling back after crashes. Um, and if we fix that, then KNFSD can advertise itself as, uh, as showing monotonic uh, change attributes, which is, has advantages for the NFS clients. Um, and then, then there we get into more future stuff, right? And a lot of this doesn't really have as much to do with NFS. Um, I think a, a change attribute is a generically useful thing. Uh, you know, being able to tell between, you know, over any time delta whether a file has changed, you know, unequivocally or not, it was is a useful thing, I think. In fact, I, you know, what I would like to do, um, so, you know, there are also, you know, user land apps that would like to use this. Um, uh, Ganesha, for instance, is user land uh, NFS server. It would like to have access to the change attribute. Um, and then there, but we kind of need to make sure that our, all of our implementations are consistent, uh, or at least make sure that we don't present a change attribute on, from file systems that don't conform to the, to the uh, spec, or to the uh, semantics we want. 
Um, and then eventually what I would like to do is, you know, I have this sort of, I've had this idea for a while, but to build a gated write like this. Uh, so basically where, where you could do a stat X, fetch the change cookie, um, you do your, a read of the data off the inode, modify it in memory, and then try to write it back, but only if nothing changed. And that would allow us to do uh, synchronized I.O. even between, you know, multiple threads on the same machine, multiple machines even, and you don't have to do file locking, which would be a huge win, because file locking is terribly expensive. Um, go ahead, Ken, you have something? Yeah, the, the pure IP gated, that's really interesting. Uh, BcacheFS also has a per extent version number. We currently only use it when encryption is enabled for the nonce, but I've got plans to start enabling it as an auto incrementing, basically a per extent change cookie. And I think we would want it at that point because otherwise, if you're doing multi threaded IO with the same file, that's going to get painful. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, or, or do what? You, you mean uh, use a more granular change cookie than, a, than the yeah, per inode? Yeah, a per extant change cookie. And it, it seems like that's, that, that might come up, be useful in other places. It would definitely be a lot more plumbing. Yeah. But it seems like it maybe gets, it makes some of the other semantics cleaner. Okay. Well, that's a possibility. I'm, yeah. I'm not opposed to that idea. You know, I guess, this, again, this is all pretty hand wavy stuff that I haven't actually tried to implement yet. Uh, you know, Doing this, though, I don't even really think it's that difficult. I mean, uh, especially not on XFS. At XFS, we could do this fairly trivially, I think. Um, ButterFS and EXT4, some of the others might be a little more difficult, cause, just because the way the locking works. But I think this would be a, a, a very useful thing. Just uh, wanted to troll. Looking at this pseudo code, it should say statics modify cookie. <laughs> OK. Modify, what now? A, You're checking it, data modification, right? It oh. should be a, a modify cookie, not a change cookie, because you're allegedly referring to M time. No, no. no? The, the NFS uh, v4 spec specifies that it changes on data and metadata updates. Um, anytime, basically, anytime the C time would change. So that uh, C time changes anytime M time changes, uh, and it changes anytime any other attribute in the inode changes. So yeah, we. we for, if we want to conform to NFS's semantics, then we would need to, it would be to change cookie like that. And this is what we've named it in the kernel too, by the way. So inside the kernel, it's called statx change cookie. Um, uh, and so Amir also asked me to present a roadmap, and this is, you know, I guess as much of a roadmap. It's more like a wish list, right, <laughs> than a roadmap. But I mean, I want to, uh, you know, one thing we need to do soon, I think, is uh, go ahead and just add support for it to be cachefs. It shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, we got to figure out what to do with XFS. Um, so I haven't quite got, you know, we've got some proposals. Maybe the timestamp, uh, maybe doing it with multigrain timestamps, maybe I should resurrect that idea if Christian th thinks it's possible. Um, we could, uh, I want to move the I version bump to after the copy to the page cache, um, you know, and maybe the timestamp updates too. Uh, it would be nice to, to have that uh, done then. Or, or maybe we could just do an extra bump, you know, I, I would be fine either way. Uh, and then I need to investigate improvements to crash resilience. I, I don't have a sufficient uh, idea of what I want to do there yet. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question that is semi-related to, 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 uh, to this work. I remember we had some sort of discussion where you shrink the inode by removing struct time spec. I've been meaning to ask you about that, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, Linus actually pointed that out. He, uh, um, you know, the, um, right now we store these things in time spec structs inside the inode but those have padding in them, uh, or they end up having padding in them once you put them all together. Um, we could, uh, we, if we split those out into individual fields, we can shrink the inode by, I think, 12 bytes. Uh, shrink struct inode by 12 bytes. I had a patch to do this, I think, at one point, but I think you weren't quite ready to take it because it was pretty new. Uh, but I can, we should resurrect that, I think, and, and do be, it in. That would be really interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah, we should go ahead and do that, I think. And uh, Amir had, had <laughs> plans for the other, for some of that space, I think, but, uh, but we should, uh, should think about it, yeah. Let's take that offline after this, Christian. I'll talk with you about it. BcacheFS also just does integer number of nanoseconds, which gets you 430 years of precision with 64 bits. And I think you end up only needing to do the conversions on certain boundaries, so it's not that bad. I'm not sure we can do that. Well, we, it's, we it's might can do that with the C time, but the others are a problem because, you, you know, you, it's not, uh, you, you know, if someone does a U times at, you know, or something, 
we have to be able to regurgitate back the value they set, right? You know, so we can't truncate bits, uh, you know, inside the inode like that. It, so, so if we were to try to do that, we, we could lose some precision, and then uh, some of it might not be, uh, wouldn't be a, enough. How would we be losing precision? We're still, still sorting, storing a nanosecond precision. If someone does M time, or does a, does a uh, U times, right, and U times that to set the M time, and to some funky value, right? It could be anything, really. It, it could be outside of that window of time that you can track, right? Something we can, we can represent, normalized? sorry? Something that's not normalized, or? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be a valid time. They might just stuff junk in there, right? You know, but we have to be able to, we have to be able to give it back if that happens. <laughs> People do this, sadly, you know, but this yeah. is the way it works. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, from a roadmap perspective, there isn't any strict dependencies between any of these, no. right? So no, in particular, not. the first three could be done in parallel if you could find people who wanted to work on them. Yes, yes. I, I, yeah, I was, that's what I would try to say a minute ago is that it's not really a roadmap, more like a wish list or a checklist or something. So, so I decided to go have a go surf through struct XFSD inode just now, and there's actually plenty of space in the inode, in the inode record to add a few more counters, but the part that I'm kind of missing here is, is having a better idea of what exactly are the counters going to be tracking, because I thought, at first I thought it would be, for, for my dorky ioctal, it would be really helpful to be able to have a change cookie that is literally just any time the file contents change, mm -hmm then bump this counter, but that's just writing to the file or truncating it or punching holes or uh, yeah, anything like that. Then a second level would be that plus all the file attributes except maybe a time because apparently that's a sticking point in every, all these discussions. And then a third level would be the existing weird XFS change counter, which is bump this anytime you log the inode in, in mm -hmm. a transaction and dump it out to disk. Yeah, I mean, in hindsight, if it, you know, if it had been up to me, probably we would have had two different ones, one to track the data and one to track mm -hmm. metadata. NFS did not specify it that way, and we're kind of stuck with it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. like, does, so, does NFS actually care about change counters bumping if you modify extended attributes? Uh, X adders were not part of the original NFS spec, uh, but yes, if you change X adders, it won't, it, we, we have them now, and yeah, we expect the change counter to bump if, uh, if the X adders change. In the so, so away goes the 20 terabytes worth of disk cache on the NFS client because somebody added an X adder? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, my, you know, my hand wavy sort of you know, thinking here is that, you know, actually metadata changes are pretty rare. You know, usually we go and set up that kind of stuff and then we start writing to them or, or we do it after. It's not ideal, but I, again, we could. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, yeah, but that's kind of what we're stuck with, unfortunately, for NFS. All right. Yeah, I, this is the first time I've actually seen PWrite gated and I thought, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a cool idea, and I'm, I'm you know, and to, you know, if I've got a few more minutes here, I don't know if it's, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I actually did, so Seth has a way to, or Rados has a way to do this, right? If you do, uh, they have a, they call it an assertion, right? You know, they, you can grab the data version of, a, of an object, uh, you know, read it, uh, modify it, and then, and then assert whether that, that version hasn't changed, and then write back, and it does all that under a, uh, you know, atomically, you know, for, along for that object. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was able to use the, this sort of model for uh, some work I did several years ago to build a, uh, a clustered uh, NFS server on top of Ceph. And because I just needed it, like, I just needed the, the different heads. They really didn't need to interact much, but, but until there was uh, just, they just needed a little bit of data to track. So there was, you know, mm -hmm. I just had built a little database in this object that was like, you know, probably like you know less less than 100 bytes right you know but but i was able to use a model like this and it was actually much easier than trying to deal with like locking across multiple machines and stuff so mm -hmm. I, I really like this this idea you know or something along those lines okay yeah the, the atomic file exchange thing that i'm working on will come it will come back in and roaring its head at some point when we actually get to the end of my development tree and actually want to implement a free space defragger for xfs because then we actually will need a bit of a harder guarantee that if you do an atomic file content exchange to move data blocks that really the file contents haven't changed. Yeah, and, and honestly what we, what we could do too is what, you know, what I've been thinking is uh, maybe what we should build is a, like a union, right, or, or a struct that has a union in it, right? So you have this, you, instead of this pointing it to the STX change cookie, we would point it at 
uh, like a, a struct that has maybe a field at the beginning that describes what we want to compare, mm -hmm. and then you actually put the data in after it. Mm -hmm. So you could do the change cookie in some cases, you could do timestamps, you could do whatever you wanted, you know, you just, mm -hmm. you know, you know, with the caveat that some of those may not be as uh, uh, rigorous as you might like, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, maybe, maybe the you and I should chat about this offline, though, yeah, and, yeah, and see the, if we can figure it out. Yeah, the so. atomic file content exchange part is getting merged for 6.10, but the actual commit range ioctl has been held back because Christoph said, hey, you actually want to gate the whole thing on this one dorky ioctl, or do you want to actually just merge all the other stuff? And I said, well, let's merge all the other stuff. Okay, okay, all right, cool. All right. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That's all I got.